I want to welcome all of you uh, students in this intro to common media studies class here at Fordham University and uh, as uh, those of you in the audience can see this is being videotaped we're going to put this up on YouTube probably sometime next week. That'll be the first week in October. So for any of you out there in the world who may be watching this, welcome uh, to this class as well. What we're going to be talking about today is the media's misreporting of Ron Paul and actually some other presidential candidates as well uh, here in the 2008 presidential campaign. And today's date is September 28th, 2007. So obviously we're going to be talking about things that have happened before this date obviously not things that may happen after this date and of course I certainly hope that there's no misreporting of anyone after this date but I'm not naive enough to think that that's going to actually happen. Before I begin going over some of the actual cases of misreporting I think it might be useful to talk about how surveys and polls are done. And this is actually an important part of our class. Later on in the term, we're going to be talking about the Nielsen ratings when we talk about television. And you should know that ever since the 1870s and 1880s, and the work of several scientists back then, including Francis Galton, who was a cousin of Charles Darwin, that scientists realized that you could go out and poll a small sample of a population and get an accurate reading of what the overall population was thinking. Any aspect of human behavior would be amenable to such a polling method. And the key ingredient in all of those polls and this pertains again to the Nielsen ratings, it pertains to the Gallup polls that you see reported on television all the time about American attitudes and political attitudes. The key ingredient in all of those polls was that the sample would be a randomly selected sample in which the people who were doing the survey went out and chose people randomly to appear in the survey. So in a few minutes I'm going to be talking about the kinds of polls that were conducted in the aftermath of several presidential debates and uh, it's important for you to bear in mind that these are not and were not scientifically conducted polls. But it's also important to bear in mind that scientifically conducted polls are not necessarily accurate and this isn't a course in statistics, so we don't have time to go over all of the examples over the years in which the polls have been wrong. But I'll just mention one which always struck me as sort of interesting and especially relevant to a course in media studies. This goes back to 1936 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was running for his second term as president. And as I'm sure you all know, he was elected then by a landslide. And in fact, went on to be elected a total of four times to the presidency. But there was a magazine back in 1936 called the Literary Digest, and they conducted a poll a few months before the election. And the Literary Digest poll found that Roosevelt was going to lose. And so they published the poll. And then, of course, after the election, they were very embarrassed. Well, what went wrong with the Literary Digest poll? It turned out that what they did in 1936, they thought they'd come up with a clever idea, and it was. They polled people by calling them on the telephone. And you don't yet know this, maybe, because we haven't gotten to the part in our course in which we talk about the invention of the telephone in 1876 and how long it took for the telephone to get into a majority of American homes. That actually didn't take place until the 1950s. So back in 1936, only very rich people had telephone service in their homes. 
That's why the Literary Digest poll, even though it was randomly selected, even though the people who participated in the poll were randomly chosen, the way that the poll was conducted biased the poll to make it seem as if Roosevelt wouldn't win because Roosevelt was never popular among the very wealthy in the United States. So that's an important thing uh, to bear in mind when we talk about whether a poll is worthwhile or not, whether it's a legitimate poll, whether someone is gaming or manipulating the poll. It's important to bear in mind that even the scientific polls are not perfect and have yielded many errors over the years. So with that in mind, let's go back a few months to May. And this, uh, that's May 2007. And this was the first time that I became aware of a problem in the way the media were reporting the presidential campaign, and in particular the way they were reporting the candidacy of Ron Paul. And let me make it clear, uh, I have not endorsed Ron Paul for president. In fact, on my blog, infiniteregress.tv, I make it clear that I think Ron Paul is by far the best Republican candidate. But I want to see each party nominate the best person, and then I'll decide who I'm going to vote for. And honestly, and you know, there's no proof of this, but I can tell you that had I discovered, for example, that Tancredo was being treated the same way that Ron Paul was, or Mitt Romney, or any of the other Republican or Democratic candidates, I'd be up here today giving this same lecture. Because the issue is not the candidate, the issue is the way the media has been reporting the candidate. Anyway, back in May there was a presidential debate. There have been many of them since then. Polls were conducted after the debate. Ron Paul surprised people by coming in first in the poll. And on ABC.com's website, uh, a discussion arose as to why did Ron Paul do so well. And anti-Ron Paul people in the comment section began saying stuff like, well, you probably had just a few people over and over again voting in the poll. This is something that uh, we're going to hear a lot of in the next, uh, in the subsequent months. But this was the first time I saw anybody talking about that. With no proof, really. Just, it's impossible, these people said, that Ron Paul could do so well. Therefore, it must be that in some way the poll was manipulated or gamed, G-A-M-E-D to use one of the hip new terms, which I try to keep up on. Ron Paul supporters responded and said, we don't know what other people did, but I voted only once in the poll. Within a few hours, ABC.com began removing comments made by Ron Paul's supporters. Some people claimed that the comments were abusive. Obviously, an online system has a right to remove comments. I can't guarantee that there were no abusive comments because I didn't see every comment. But I have seen some of the comments. They were not the slightest bit abusive. And people began complaining. What are you doing removing comments? Within a few hours after that, ABC shut down its own message board. At that time, uh, I wrote a blog post about it and basically said in the blog post, it was an open letter to ABC, look, do you, know, do you have any evidence that the polls were manipulated? Do you have any proof? Uh, why did you remove the comments of Ron Paul supporters? And even worse than that, why did you shut down your own message board? Well, 
unsurprisingly, I didn't receive uh, any answer. You know, one uh, advantage that someone who might work for ABC News has over this class is they're not students in my class, they don't have to answer a question. And so they ignored what I and many other people were saying. About a month later, word came out that, oh, we're sorry, there was some kind of technical problem which caused us to shut the board down. Uh, I don't believe that for a second. It's an awfully big coincidence that this problem happened right at the time that this controversy was arising. Now, had that been the only problem, I also wouldn't be up here talking about this. Because people make mistakes. You know, I would be the first to say we talk about ABC, but what really might have happened in that instance was someone working uh, on ABC's website, one particular human being might have panicked and shut down the system. So I'm willing to understand media are run by human beings, people make mistakes, but Sadly, that was only the beginning, and only the beginning of a much worse series of incidents. So let's uh, continue. Now let's go to uh, July and early August. And here we find a very interesting uh, series of media responses to the Ron Paul candidacy, and since our class is only 50 minutes in length, I'm not going to have time to go over every one in much detail, but again, you can find descriptions of them all over the web, uh, including on my blog, infiniteregress.tv, but they're all over the place. The Iowa caucus, actually the Iowa straw poll uh, for the Iowa caucus, because the actual Iowa caucus hasn't taken place yet, this was a straw poll that uh, the people in Iowa participate in. And as I'm sure you know, a straw poll isn't binding, but it is an early indication of how people in the state of Iowa feel about their presidential candidates. And this was a, a straw poll for the Republican Party in the state of Iowa. Several interesting things happened. Here's one of them. Again, on ABC.com's website, there were photographs, coverage of the supporters who had come to Iowa to demonstrate and show their support. And on one page in particular, there was a very interesting juxtaposition of photographs. On the one side, you had a photograph of a huge number of cheering people holding up signs for Mitt Romney. Right next to it, you had a photograph in which it said, Ron Paul's supporters. In that photograph, there were a total of one person, one poor guy standing there almost, you know, in this poignant, it could have been a scene out of a movie, standing there holding an umbrella to shield himself from the sun and holding up a Ron Paul placard. So if you had come to ABC.com's website wondering what kind of reaction there was in Iowa to the Republican candidates, you would have gotten the unmistakable conclusion that Mitt Romney had a huge number of cheering supporters. Ron Paul had one poor guy who was in danger of getting sunstroke holding up this uh, placard. Well, I did a little research. Again, you can as well. I've seen video coverage of this very rally. And I discovered, much to my chagrin for the media, that actually Ron Paul had a huge number of supporters also. Now, who knows who had more supporters? And I'm not 
saying anything against Mitt Romney's supporters. I am willing to acknowledge Mitt Romney had a large number of supporters. But clearly, ABC.com was giving its readers the impression that Ron Paul had virtually no supporters when in fact he had a lot of supporters. So now, let's just look at this progression. ABC.com starts off in May taking out comments by Ron Paul supporters. Not good, but I would admit not the worst infraction in the world. And within a month or two, they've now escalated into using an outrageously misleading, deceptive, and that's the only word for it, a uh, pair of photographs to show the relative strength of the supporters of two Republican candidates. Well, Ron Paul did not win the Iowa straw poll. He came in somewhere in the middle. After the results of the poll came in, and now we move from ABC.com to ABC television. So again, you can see the escalation because many, many, many more people are watching television than come to a web page. George Stephanopoulos, if the name sounds familiar to you, he first became known during the Clinton administration. He was an advisor to former President Bill Clinton and uh, later went on to get a job at ABC News. And Stephanopoulos is now one of their prime commentators, political reporters. And uh, there was a uh, discussion uh, in the green room. That's the name of, uh, of a show on ABC. Uh, it takes place after uh, the poll has taken place and the results have been reported. As some of you may know, the term green room comes from television. It's a place where the talent waits before they go on the show. Anyway, in this uh, discussion, uh, various candidates were mentioned, including people who did not do as well as Ron Paul. And I'm sure you can see where this is going. Ron Paul was not mentioned. It's as if he didn't exist. Now, here, let me say that so far I've concentrated on ABC, and there are a couple of other things I'm going to mention to you about ABC. But ABC is by no means the only media operation that has done this kind of stuff. And let me also say Ron Paul is not the only political candidate who has suffered from it. So at this point, let me just spread out our focus and look at newspapers. And in particular, the newspaper coverage of this Iowa straw poll, which again, many people think to be uh, an important first indication of how people may vote in this extremely important state. Well, uh, I did a pretty extensive survey of the newspapers, and actually I was happy to find that the New York Times, they reported the results accurately. They had uh, a complete list of all the candidates and how they did, and a little about each of them. USA Today, which by the way is the largest circulation newspaper in the United States, over two million circulation. They did a very good job. Associated Press isn't a newspaper, it's uh, a, a news service, and I'm sure most of you have seen the AP byline. What the Associated Press does is they write up stories and then they send it out to thousands of affiliate newspapers around the country. They reported the results pretty well. One newspaper did not, the Washington Post. So, you know, the newspaper part of our media constellation does not get away from this unscathed. One major newspaper, uh, the Washington Post, which in many uh, ways is the worst because it's in Washington, left Ron Paul's name out of its article. 
Now, just to be clear, in the case of the Green Room on ABC, in the case of the Washington Post, these things can't happen by accident. We need to be 100% clear about this. They can't. Uh, because the, in, in the case of a television news show, it's very heavily produced. You have lots of people, even if somebody makes a mistake. You've seen this happen many times when someone's on television and they're talking, you know, a news anchor or a reporter or whatever, and they make a mistake. They leave something out. They say something wrong. You know, within five or ten minutes, they come back on with like a big smile. Oh, we're really sorry. Uh, I misspoke. Such and such is the case. And newspapers are even more carefully edited than that. So someone made a decision to leave Ron Paul's name out. Now, I'm just going to tell you about a few other things, and then we'll move into why I think this is happening, uh, what may happen in the future what can be done about it. But let me just give you a couple of more examples. Let's go back again to ABC. And sad to say, I mean, ABC has been by far the worst in this. Uh, and on the other end, CNN, MSNBC, and CBS have been by and large OK. None of them have been perfect, but MSNBC, for example, at the very beginning, when Ron Paul first started doing well in these uh, post um, debate polls. There was an exchange between Keith Olbermann and Chris Matthews in which they were somewhat sarcastic about it. But by and large, MSNBC has been fine. Well, here's what happened with ABC also in August last month. There was a radio show, and I don't know if any of you listened to it. It's actually produced and situated primarily right here in New York City on WABC, part of the afternoon lineup, Mark Levin. I'm ashamed to say he almost has the same name that I do. Uh, I'm ashamed to say because I want to be associated with this guy in any way, as you'll see in a second. The uh, radio show, though, is not just in New York. It's nationally syndicated on ABC's network. And this isn't an example of misreporting. This is an example of propaganda taken right out of Joseph Goebbels' handbook. And you might ask, who is Joseph Goebbels? Well, we're going to get to him later on in the term as well. He was Adolf Hitler's minister of propaganda. That was literally his title. And what Goebbels said is when you want to oppose someone, you don't just come right out face to face and have a debate with the person because you might not do that well. Goebbels was a very smart guy. He had a PhD from the University of Heidelberg, so he was no dummy. Unfortunately, he uses intelligence for evil. But one of the things that Goebel says, if you want to undermine someone that you don't agree with, you try to make their supporters lose confidence in the person that they're supporting. You try to like work underneath and, and make the person's supporters feel that it's a hopeless task, that they don't have a chance. And that's a very good way, Goebel said, of overcoming an enemy that you might disagree with. So with that in mind, let's look at what Mark Levin said to his listeners on a fine August afternoon just last month. He said, you know, he's sick and tired of hearing all this about Ron Paul, you know, and it's complete nonsense. And he urged his listeners to call up Ron Paul headquarters as often as they could and basically say, your candidate has no chance of winning you know, you, know, you didn't speak to me uh, when you were talking about the polls. And Mark Levin's idea was that if he could get enough people to call up Ron Paul's headquarters, that somehow uh, it would make the campaign lose hope. Uh, frankly, it's a stupid idea. I don't know why he thought anyone would really take that seriously, but that's not the point. The point is, what is a radio commentator doing urging listeners to basically conduct what we would today call a disinformation campaign. Or what Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's minister of propaganda, would call a propagandistic campaign. 
And is it a coincidence that it took place again on an ABC franchise? And if ABC as a corporation was against this, which I hope they were, I didn't hear anything, why didn't they fire this guy? He's still on the air. Well, let me just say one other thing about ABC, and then uh, we'll talk about Fox, who uh, has not been doing a very good job in this either. And I'll resist saying uh, I was less surprised about Fox. Well, I guess I didn't resist saying it, I just said it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I was more surprised about ABC than Fox. Uh, but one other thing about ABC to show that they are an equal opportunity abuser of freedom of the press. Dennis Kucinich is running for president. Uh, he's a Democrat. He has some similarities to Ron Paul. Ron Paul thinks the war in Iraq is unconstitutional and we should withdraw immediately. Uh, Kucinich uh, feels the same way and voted against the war. And I guess, uh, I don't know if that's what it was that got ABC's ire, but once again, there was a photograph that was taken about a month ago, this time of the Democratic candidates, and you know how they're all standing there. And guess what? Poor Kucinich is cropped out of the photograph. So were someone to look at that photograph, Again, on an abc.com website, no Dennis Kucinich. I mean, I just don't get it. Where do they get off doing that? ABC thinks Kucinich is not an important enough candidate. Who cares what they think, right? They're supposed to report, not basically mold stories to their liking. And before I get to Fox, let me just say uh, a little bit about the First Amendment. Because you'll hear me uh, during this course, and uh, you'll see in uh, one of the assigned texts, the soft edge, that I am a staunch defender of the First Amendment. In fact, I think the First Amendment has to be interpreted in an absolute 100% fashion, meaning that when it says, Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or the press, I think the phrase no law means just that. So I think the FCC is unconstitutional. Uh, the FCC tries to regulate broadcasters. And I think any attempt of the government to dictate anything whatsoever to any organ of the press is unconstitutional. Were I president, which of course I'll never be, I would, I don't know if it would be my very first act, but by the end of the first day I would fire everyone in the FCC. Anyhow, my point is, however, that I think the media are entitled to this level of protection from the government. Thomas Jefferson thought that. So did James Madison and James Monroe, our founding fathers who drafted the First Amendment. But I think the media have a responsibility. The reason that there's a First Amendment that protects the press and not someone who's selling shoes or pizza or cars is because as Thomas Jefferson realized, the press is essential for the health of our democracy. It's essential that the American people get the truth. Now, the press can make mistakes. Everyone, again, understands that. And as I said at the very beginning, the people in the media, we shouldn't make any mistake about it. They're human beings just as we are. They're capable of making a mistake. But when there is a systematic record of constant misreporting, then that's not just a mistake. And I think that ABC in particular, and Fox News to a lesser but still significant extent, have forfeited 
their right to hold themselves up as mass media doing the business of our democracy. Now, I still don't think that the government should go after them because that would do even more damage. But I think that they are not living up to what Jefferson and the Founding Fathers expected of our mass media. Neither did the Washington Post, in the example I gave you earlier when they left out Ron Paul's name, but at least in the case of the Washington Post, it happened once. All right, let's take a look at uh, Fox, and uh, there are several examples, uh, but I want to give you uh, the most recent uh, example. So I I'm happy to say about ABC that the most recent example that I know about of misreporting uh, did not happen on ABC, it happened on Fox News. It was after um, not the most recent presidential Republican debate, which actually took place just last night. It was on PBS. That, by the way, was an interesting debate. The four leading Republican candidates did not deign to show up for that debate. And I don't know why. Uh, it was held at a primarily African-American university, moderated by Tavis Smiley. So your guess is as good as mine uh, as to why Romney, Giuliani, Fred Thompson, and McCain didn't show up for that debate. But in the debate prior to that, which took place on Fox News, Fox conducted its own poll after the debate. And again, I'm sure you're expecting what I'm going to say because it's the same pattern repeating itself. Right after the debate, uh, Hannity and Combs were on the air. Sean Hannity, Alan Combs, they're on Fox every night after Bill O'Reilly's Factor. And they say, well, hey, you know, we're going to tell you the results of the poll that's now taking place. They put a number on the screen, call up and vote. And they're interviewing the various candidates. And within about 15 or 20 minutes, the results start coming in. And there up on the screen, in first place, is Ron Paul. Now, Hannity and Combs disagree on most things. I mean, that's the idea of the show. This is Fox's idea of being fair and balanced. They have like about 120 people who are conservative and one liberal uh, Combs. But on that show, I guess uh, you could say that show is fair and balanced because you have one conservative, Sean Hannity, one liberal, Alan Combs. And understandably, they disagree about most things. But listen to this. Here's something they didn't disagree on which was that somehow Ron Paul's coming in first wasn't a real result. And they both like started saying stuff along the lines of, yeah, you probably had Ron Paul supporters voting more than once, multiple <coughs> dialing. Uh, this happened three or four times when they announced the results. Even to show what multiple dialing was, one of them you know, started like, you know, doing this kind of thing. You know, isn't that wonderful, these, these great nonverbal uh, gestures? You know what? It turns out it's impossible to do multiple dialing in that situation. I tried it myself and so did many other people. And if you had called in on your cell phone, and then 20 minutes later or five minutes later you called in again, and you were hoping to inflate the vote for Ron Paul or any other candidate, you'd have gotten a message from Fox saying, thank you, but your vote has already been recorded. Because obviously Fox is not that naive. You know, it's a trivially easy thing to program a phone response system. Let's grant that Hannity and Combs might not have known that, although I don't see how they could not have known, but let's grant that the first time when they belittled, when they denigrated Ron Paul's first place finish, Let's give Hannity and Combs the benefit of the doubt that they didn't know about that multiple dialing system. And they didn't know that Fox had programmed us so that it didn't take 
more than one call from one number. Again, just so you understand how television news works, there are producers who are sitting in a control room watching this. You know, there are assistants. It's not as if Hannity and Combs or anyone is just going out there over the airways, you know, on cable, and nobody from Fox, no one from their production outfit is watching what's going on. No, it's not like that at all. And so I would say it's impossible that no one at Fox who knew about how the poll was conducted, that no one told Hannity and Combs that they were wrong. So let's, just to sum up this part of it, here is what we have with the media misreporting of Ron Paul. Uh, we have a discussion on a website being shut down. Uh, we have consistent either belittling of results of polls conducted either through the internet or through cell phones when Ron Paul does well. I haven't even told you all the examples. Uh, we have uh, a radio talk show host urging people to call up uh, and conduct a campaign of disinformation against Ron Paul. We have not only ABC doing this, but the Washington Post at one point, and Fox News as well, and not only directed against Ron Paul, but against Dennis Kucinich as well. So what's going on here? Why is this happening? And again, you know, there are some people, probably many people in the academic world, who would say, well, what do you expect of Fox? But actually, I have a high regard for Fox. I don't agree with a lot of what they say, but I don't think that Fox is trying to systematically uh, give false information. So why did Hannity and Combs do that? And even more so, ABC, I mean, when was the last time you heard of ABC being involved in any kind of controversy? The truth of the matter is, ABC News is, you know, pretty much off the map. Uh, you know, the, uh, NBC does far better than ABC does in the nightly news. So, you know, what's ABC's problem? Some people think that there's a conspiracy, uh, that somehow someone gives these media marching orders to do this. I don't. Um, Here's what I think uh, is actually happening. I think that the mass media desperately want to be relevant. The mass media, the people in the mass media, don't understand the internet. They don't understand the new media environment. It is true, and this is why I mentioned polls at the beginning, it is true that the scientifically conducted polls, the Gallup polls, the polls conducted by the New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC, all the major news organizations sponsor polls, that those polls show Ron Paul support at about 3%. Uh, he's ahead of uh, Duncan, What's his last name? I want to say Duncan Hines, but I don't think that's his last name. <laughs> hey, sorry, Duncan. Um, but uh, Rob Paul is ahead of Duncan. He's ahead of uh, Tancredo. But I mean, he's not doing very well in the national scientifically conducted polls. So I think it's because of that that the people in the mass media, when they get a result, that goes contrary to what they think is the truth. They don't want to be embarrassed, so that's why they don't mention Ron Paul. That's why they denigrate when he comes in first. But I think a far better approach would be for the mass media to say, look, we don't know why this is happening. There is a discrepancy between what the national scientifically conducted polls are reporting and what is happening over and over again. 
And you know, there are things that are happening that the mass media are probably even dimly aware of. If you look at Technorati, if you look at DIG, these are two sites that each in their own ways keep track of what's going on on the web. Uh, if you look at just about anything that keeps track of what's happening on the web, stories about Ron Paul are consistently number one in terms of the number of readings that they get, the number of hits. So are there just a few Ron Paul supporters sitting somewhere in a room, they have no life and they're just constantly hitting these stories? Maybe, but I doubt it. And maybe uh, a healthier approach for our democracy would be for the media to look into this discrepancy. Because maybe what's going on is what happened back in 1936. Or maybe what's going on, as I'm sure you've all heard of, and we're going to talk about this later on this term as well, in the election of 1948, that famous newspaper which says, Dewey wins. And, you know, there's a great picture of Truman holding it up the next day with a big smile on his face because Truman won. So why did the newspaper print the wrong result? Because at the time they went to press, their polls, which were conducted primarily in eastern states, made that newspaper believe that Dewey was going to win. But, you know, the polls turned out to be wrong. Any questions about this? Yes? Um, are, there, are there any news stations that have reported on, on the misreporting and have tried to unveil it? And if so, would they even air it? That's a very good question. And just in case you didn't hear that, the question was, are there any stations that have reported on the misreporting? And the answer is, as far as I know, no. And I think it would be a great story. I think, what what'd you say? I think because we're talking about the, the same mass media that do this, and I think that the other mass media, say like MSNBC, CNN, th they're very close perhaps towards doing this also. They haven't done it, but I think that all the mass media are pretty much the same in their misunderstanding of what's happening uh, on the internet. And I think that, uh, you know, they, they don't want to get into a story where somehow they themselves might be caught up. But uh, it's an excellent question because I predict that pretty soon we will see reports about this if it continues. And one other thing your question makes me uh, want to mention, which is the most recent transgressions have happened at Fox News, not ABC. So it's possible that ABC maybe has woken up to what's going on there. Why yes. Why is it, just because he doesn't support the war, why is everyone ganging up on him? The question is, why Ron Paul? Well, I think the reason is because of the discrepancy of how Ron Paul is doing in the national scientifically conducted polls and how he does in these call-in polls, where, again, the people who call in are not randomly selected. So this makes people think, well, maybe somehow some kind of, you know, shenanigans are going on behind the scenes. But it's also true, I think, and you're right, that, that Ron Paul, I think, is frightening to the establishment uh, because let's just look at the war. We went to war without a declaration of war. There are other things that were wrong with why we went to war, but basically, the, what did the media do when we went to war in Iraq? The answer is they supported the war, right? I think the media fell their responsibility then as well. They should have been on the story of whether there were weapons of mass destruction. Ron Paul makes that point, so I think he makes people uh, feel uncomfortable. Yes? The campaign obviously sees what's going on. Have they released any comments in regards to what Fox and ABC as well as Washington Post have been doing and reporting? Uh, Ron Paul's campaign officially has not, but there are a huge number of Ron Paul websites and uh, groups. For example, the Ron Paul New York Meetup Group, uh, Ron Paul for President 2008. So most of his websites constantly publish uh, stories about this. But Ron Paul's campaign in itself, as far as I know, has not released an official uh, statement about this one way or another. I think they're trying to stay sort of above the fray. You have to be, by the way, careful when you attack the media. I mean, it's easy for me to attack the media because I'm a professor. I, my 
you know, profession doesn't depend on the media coverage that I get. So I don't care. Don't cover me. Don't talk about me. Who cares? But if you're, you know, running for president, it's a very touchy thing to lash out at the very media that you need to get your story out there. So that, that might be why Ron Paul's official campaign hasn't said anything. I wish they would, though. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, you're talking about conspiracy. Do you think there's any connection between the media avoiding Ron Paul and the fact that he's supported in large part by 9 11 truth? The question is is there any connection between uh, the media's misreporting Ron Paul and the fact that Ron Paul has supported, I don't know if you use this word, but I will, nutcases who think that there was some kind of deliberate bringing down of the towers uh, on September 11th. No, I don't think there's any connection whatsoever, because uh, first of all, that's not Ron Paul's position. And second of all, I, I don't know anyone other than those conspiracy theorists who uh, are, are saying that theory. I, but again, I would be the first to say, I can't get into these people's heads. And I think, you know, ABC in particular really is astonishing because it's, it goes across such a wide stretch of ABC media, their web page, their radio, their television. So I don't know what their problem is, but it, you know, if you're asking me, do I think it's because of what you suggested? No, I don't. Yes. Um, which media or which medium of news do you think is most reliable? Do you think maybe the internet would be better than television, maybe newspapers would be better than radio? Or? I think we're living right now in a very exciting time. And the question is, which kind of medium do I think is more reliable for reporting the news? I think we're living in a time of transition. I think even just five years ago, television, newspapers, and radio were pretty much the only games in town that people paid any attention to. And even four years ago, Howard Dean tried to mount a campaign on the internet and obviously failed. However, I think with every day that goes by, YouTube, blogging, podcasting, these new media are becoming more and more and important. And I think what we're seeing with the misreporting of Ron Paul by the mainstream media, if you take out the personality, if you take out even Ron Paul's positions, we're seeing a conflict between old media who are fossilized, becoming less relevant, Network television is losing viewers in the millions. You know, back in the 1970s, you would have an average audience on any night of network news of over 50 million. Now they're lucky if they draw 15 million. So yeah, I think that the internet is uh, the way to go for the future of reporting. Listen, it looks like we're just about out of time. I want to thank you very much.